Recently, I did some really deep scholarly intellectual research. It was called Wikipedia. <laughs> and if Wikipedia is correct, there have only been a handful of books in all of human history that have sold 100 million copies or more. Harry Potter made the list, The Hobbit made the list, some of the, like, the classics of global literature. But you know what's so unique about this book, the Bible? This book, the Bible, has not just sold 100 million copies in its existence. This book, the Bible, sells 100 million copies every single year. Can you believe that? Whether you believe this book or not, whether you've read it or not, there is nothing in all of humanity that has equaled the impact and the exposure of this book that I hold in my hands. That's why this week I want to talk to you about the Bible. Do you know what the Bible is? Have you ever read it? Just parts of it or half of it or all of it? Do you feel like you understand it? Why in the world would you read it in the midst of your busy life? And if you want to read it, how should you read it and where should you start and what's it all about? This week, I want to cover a big picture of what this book is. And I have a, a bold goal that for the rest of your life, you would not just feel obliged to, but you would want to open this book and read the wisdom in its pages. I pray that starting this week and hopefully for the rest of your life, you would turn to this book for guidance, wisdom, grace, faith, and salvation. Now, before I jump into all the details this week, I want you to, to think about this one shocking and beautiful thing that you have something that Jesus himself did not have. If you have one of these on your phone, if you keep one of these by the side of your bed, if there's one of these in your church or in your home, you literally have something that Jesus himself did not have. When Jesus was growing up, there wasn't a children's Bible next to his bed. When he was around the dinner table with Mary and his stepdad, Joseph, they didn't open up the scrolls of the Bible to study. No, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, when he was on this earth, he only got little glimpses of the Bible when they'd pulled the scrolls out at synagogue worship. So think of that. If you have a Bible in your possession, you can literally open up these pages wherever and whenever, however much you want. What a crazy blessing it is to live at this time in history. Just a couple weeks ago, my family and I took a road trip to the East Coast. And we were in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress. And there, at a special display behind thick glass, was a Gutenberg Bible. Have you heard of those before? About 500 years ago, this guy Gutenberg invented the printing press, which allowed books not to be copied by hand, but to be mass produced. And there behind the thick glass was an original copy of a Gutenberg Bible. And it was a reminder that what we maybe take for granted, lots of people didn't. <laughs> Many people never would have touched a Bible in their hands for their entire lives. And as I left the Library of Congress that day, I thought about what a blessing this is. That wherever I am, however much I'm spiritually struggling, whether I'm rich or poor, I can get a free app or a free copy from a church or pay 10 or 15 bucks online and hold in my hands this book that has changed the world and has changed people's eternities. I want to leave you today with just one passage that comes from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says this, For the word of God is alive and active. If you're looking for a living word, something that gets into your heart and lives and changes and grows, if you want spiritual activity in your life, you want to move and not stay stuck, but get closer to God through his son Jesus, there is a perfect place to go and it's the word of God. And thank the Lord you don't have to travel to some church or some synagogue to get in contact with it. Because of the place that you and I live in history, we can open these pages wherever we want and we can have an encounter with God. I can't wait to tell you more about this book this week. But for now, would you join me and would you pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us. We don't have to guess what you're like. We don't have to wonder what you would do. Instead, we can open the pages of this book and we can find Jesus, the one who gave up everything so that people like us could have everything forever. Inspire us this week, not just to pick up a copy of the Bible here and there, but to, vote, to devote ourselves to it that we would find incredible peace and joy as we think about all the blessings that come. We pray this all boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever heard of the movie, The Sixth Sense? It was released in 1999, the year that I graduated from high school. So some of you are way too young to know this movie reference. 
But it was a classic film with Bruce Willis. And while I won't spoil it for you, I will tell you this, that you really don't know what the whole movie is about until you get to the end. The Bible is a book that's kind of like that. This week, as I've tried to open your eyes to how beautiful and beneficial this book is, I could tell you about all the little parts and divisions so you could grasp all its different pieces. Or I could just go to the end and tell you what the whole book is about. So, which do you prefer? Do you want the little puzzle pieces or do you want to see the box top? <laughs> well, today, how about I give you both? The Bible is this one book that has changed the world. Every single year, a hundred million copies of this book are sold. But this one book, the Bible, is actually divided into two parts that people call the two testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. You might think of these pages, the Old Testament, as the BC, the before Jesus part, and the books of the New Testament, these pages, as the AD, in the year of our Lord part. And yet, if you want to get even more specific, you could say that the Old Testament was broken into 39 separate books. We call them the books of the Bible, but you might think of them as mini books within this bigger book. The New Testament has books too, 27 different ones that make up the years from about 40 to 100 AD, just after the time of Jesus. The books of the Old Testament were originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic by famous authors like the prophet Moses or King David, King Solomon or the prophet Isaiah. The books of the New Testament were written by the eyewitnesses mostly of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Apostle Paul, Peter, his brothers James and Jude. And yet, if you want to get even more detailed, these 66 books of the Old and New Testament are divided into chapters and verses. It's important for you to know that those weren't originally in the Bible when it was written. They were added many, many years later so that people could find their way through this long and sometimes complicated book. If you're a Bible nerd, uh, there are 1,189 separate chapters and there are 31,173 separate verses. <laughs> so at the minute level, you could say that there are over 31,000 little puzzle pieces that all fit together to make up the chapters and then the books and then the Testament and then the entire Bible. You got all that? <laughs> okay, that's a little bit too complicated. Let me get way to the end of this incredible book. Let me read you just one single verse of those 31,000 plus so that just like the movie The Sixth Sense, you can grasp what this book is all about. The very last chapter, Revelation 22, verse 4, says this, They, the people of God, will see his face. What is this massive, life-changing book about? It's about people like you and like me seeing the face of God. It's about nothing, no decision we've ever made, no mistake we've ever chosen, no addiction we've ever battled with, no embarrassing part of our life, nothing in the past, present, or future, nothing gets in the way of us being with God face to face. In the Bible's last chapter, there is satisfaction, there is joy, there is rest, there is peace, there is contentment, there is this life that you and I are craving to find and how do we find it? According to the Bible, by seeing the face of God. So as you jump into this book, as you try to understand all those little verses and the bigger chapters, the larger books, the testaments, and, and cover to cover this book, I want you to think about that. This is a book about being with God. This is a book that focuses on what Jesus did so that people like us could be with God. So let me leave you with one last story today. About 500 years ago, there was a man who made his own translation of the Bible into his native language. His name was Martin Luther. And he sparked a revolution of sorts, a reformation within the church. And there's this kind of classic painting of Martin Luther by a contemporary artist of his day named Lucas Cranach. And Cranach depicted Pastor Luther up in his high pulpit preaching to these people. And down on the other side of the painting are all these people, poor people, rich people, university professors, uh, common farmers. And in between the crowd and Pastor Luther is this floating image of Jesus on a cross. Now, Chronic was trying to depict that when Luther preached, he talked about Jesus, the only one who could forgive our sins to get us to God. But here's my favorite part of the painting. Up in Martin Luther's pulpit, the place where he spoke and preached, there was an open Bible and he had his finger in it pointing to this specific verse on this specific page that would talk about Jesus. But in Chronic's painting, guess what page that is? We don't know. 
He chose to leave it blank so that whenever Martin Luther preached on this book or on that one, uh, on this chapter or on this one, he would always tell people about the Jesus who died for sins so that people like us could see the face of God. I'll admit the Bible is a pretty complicated book, but let me jump to the ending so I can keep it simple. There is a Savior, a Jesus, who gave up everything so that you could find everything in the presence of God. Let's pray. Uh, dear God, what an amazing book. We would be so happy, so completely satisfied. All of our fears would disappear if we could just get a clear view of your glorious face. I pray that you would use this book today and throughout this week to help us do just that. We can't see you, but we can read the things that you wrote. So let them give us joy and clarity and peace that we can rejoice that one day when we take our last breath, our faith will disappear and we will see you face to face. We long for that day. Give us faith to hold on until it comes. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So where do you start reading the Bible? This week we've been talking about this book that sells over a hundred million copies every year. This book that has changed global history and it has changed individual lives like mine and perhaps like yours. And we've talked about what the Bible is really about. Despite its 31,173 verses, 1,189 chapters, 66 books, two testaments, this book is about seeing the face of God. It's about the Jesus who came so that we could be with God and find lasting happiness and real life in him. So if that motivates you to pick up this book, where should you start? <laughs> it seems like kind of an obvious question, right? You pick up books and you start on the first page. But maybe you've heard that the Bible is a little bit more complicated than that. That many people who are motivated to read the Bible open it and they get a couple pages in and then they abruptly stop because the Bible's weird. I mean, there talks about animal sacrifice and this big church you have to build that settles someplace in the Middle East. This stuff was written, what, 3,500 years ago by some Jewish prophet on the other side of the planet. Like, that's maybe not the best place to start reading the Bible. And so you'll hear that many Christians say, you shouldn't start in the first pages of the Bible. You should actually start with the story of Jesus in the New Testament. You should read what are called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I think that's pretty good advice, but I don't think it's the greatest advice. I have to admit, I've given many people that same advice. You should get to know the teachings of Jesus, who he was, what he said, and what he did. So I send people home with their Bibles and soon enough, I find out that it didn't really work. There were too many confusing words. There were too many verses people didn't understand. They didn't, they didn't grasp it. And, and so here's my, my new advice. That if you want to start reading the Bible, if you want to understand its story and its message, you can start on whatever page you want as long as you're starting with someone by your side. In other words, I think you should read the Bible not as an individual, but in a community with other people who are a little bit further down the biblical road than you. It'll take some humility, but I guarantee you it will bless you if you do. Now, to prove that, I want to turn to an incredible story in the Bible in the book of Acts chapter 8. Here we meet an Ethiopian man who was very rich. Uh, we can assume that he was very intelligent. We know that he had a faith. He worshiped God. He actually traveled from his homeland all the way to Jerusalem in a chariot so he could worship with God's people. But the funny thing is, when it came to the Bible, he didn't exactly understand all of it. And so God sent a more knowledgeable Christian, a man named Philip, to run up alongside the chariot and to speak to this man. And I want to jump into the story right there. Verse 30 of Acts chapter 8. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? The man said. Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. It's the perfect question, right? It's so honest. How, how can I understand this book? You know, Isaiah lived 700 years before this Ethiopian man. He was from Ethiopia. Isaiah was from Israel. There was so much distance. But there was someone who could help him understand it. And when he did, I'll, I'll let you read the rest of the story, he finds such joy. He finds this life with God. He's baptized in Jesus' name and his faith is never the same. So I suppose I could tell you on this video that you should read the Bible that you should open it up right now. And I hope you do, but I hope you do with someone at your side. 
So I'm going to pray today against pride. The kind of pride that thinks that you're smart enough to get it or that you're just going to read enough websites to grasp all of it. There's no way you're going to grasp the depth of this life-changing book unless you have people with you. There's a really popular Bible app called the U version, but I think the best version to read the Bible in is the we version. It's with brothers and sisters in the faith who can teach, who can instruct, who can correct, who can pray, who can encourage, who can help you grow in your faith. So, let's ask God in prayer for the humility it takes to read the Bible together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the wisdom and the faith that you have given to other Christians. So many of us want to grow in our faith. We want to understand all these verses that you put inside this life-changing book. But some of them are too hard for us right now. And so we're so grateful, Lord, that in our family, perhaps, or in our circle of friends, or at our church, there are wiser, older Christians who grasp it and see the beauty of all of those verses. We pray today against pride, against that temptation of the devil that would keep us from real spiritual growth. We pray that you would plant a seed of humility in our hearts right now that would not just open the Bible again and be stumped, but instead would send a text or an email or pick up the phone or ask someone to humbly disciple us and teach us so that we can grow. Father, like the Ethiopian, we want to leave today rejoicing. And we're not going to be able to unless we get a clear, understood word from you. So help us get there with the help of your people. We pray this all with confidence in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, one of my favorite professors told me an incredible story that makes me love the Bible more than ever. The story was about a youth pastor who wanted to take the church youth group to a deeper spiritual level. Now, they were used to playing paintball and having fun and doing games and having pizza and too much caffeine and and sugar. But he really wanted them to get closer to God. And he wanted them to get closer to God through this book, the Bible. So before the youth group arrived, he went into the church basement and he set up a circle of folding chairs and put one singular chair in the middle of the circle. Then on the outside of all the chairs, he wrote on little note cards different Bible passages that offered forgiveness and grace and hope and comfort. When all the students arrived, he asked them to find a chair on the outside of the circle. And then he was hoping that one student would be brave enough to sit in the center chair. And the plan was to blindfold the student sitting in the center chair and have them just openly confess the things they were struggling with. Now, what kind of sins were they battling? What kind of embarrassment did they feel spiritually? What shame were they carrying with them? What fears did they have for the future? And then, as the students on the outside of the circle listened to that confession, they could read those Bible passages and remind them of the comfort, forgiveness, and peace we find in Jesus. It was an amazing plan, according to the youth pastor, but it didn't exactly work. (laughs) Apparently, none of the teenage boys were really excited about sitting there in front of their buddies and the girls they were trying to impress and confessing their greatest fears. There was a couple that joked off, they acted like little clowns, and the pastor thought this was going to crash and burn and he should probably just find a movie and order some pizza. But before he kiboshed the idea, there was a girl who raised her hand. It was the brand new girl to the Bible study. And she said, I'll go. And so the pastor put the blindfold on and before he had barely tied the knot, she started to weep. She confessed that her home life was a mess, that her father was abusive. In fact, that very day he had said that he wished that she had never been born and she shouldn't even come home. And as the students on the outside of the circle sat there in shock, the youth pastor nodded. Read the passage, he gestured to them. And so one of the kids looked at the note card in his hands and read the words of Jesus. But I will never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. Now, you don't understand that the girl kept going, my own father doesn't even love me. And the youth pastor pointed at another kid sitting on the outside of the circle and he read a passage about the everlasting, unfailing, gracious love of God, our Heavenly Father. And the girl broke down, she was crying and she took the blindfold off her face and she looked at the youth pastor and she said, Pastor, why doesn't God speak to me like that? And the pastor smiled. And can you guess what he said? Honey, he just did. 
I love thinking of the Bible that way. In this book, when we read these verses, it's not just some person speaking to us. It's God. This passage from 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture, all the pages, all the chapters, all the verses, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful. It's like breathed out from God. It comes from inside God himself, from his very heart, and it is so useful for us as we go through life. Now, if you're more logical, I know that sounds like a circular argument. Well, the Bible is God's word because the Bible says it's God's word. (laughs) That's a fair objection and tomorrow I'm going to try to answer it. But just for today, let's imagine if that was true, that God was speaking to us in this book. I think two incredible things would happen in our spiritual lives. First, we would be confronted and second, we would be comforted. When we open this book and we read its teachings, we would be confronted. Because if this isn't like Peter or James or John or Moses or David, but God himself speaking to us, then when he tells us to stop it, to change, to turn around, to be different, we can't just shrug and say, well, that was Peter's opinion. If this is God speaking, it's not smart to talk back to the word of God because we talk back to God himself. It confronts the things we love too much, the the habits that we don't want to change. It would be foolish for us to rebel against the words of this book because they come from God. And yet at the same time, this book would offer us such incredible comfort. If the Bible says that God so loved the world and that just wasn't John's opinion, that came from God, it means you're loved. If the Apostle Paul would say, it's by grace that you have been saved and it's not by works, then even if you've struggled to do enough good works, you could still believe you're saved. Because that wasn't Paul, that was God. When Jeremiah would write that God has made this deal with us, that he doesn't just forgive our sins, but he will remember them no more. (laughs) That's not just some Jewish dude from 3,000 years ago. That's God himself. And so like that young woman, you can pour out your heart, your struggles, your embarrassment, your shame, your sin, and you never have to wonder, why doesn't God ever speak to me? Pastor Jesus, the Apostle Paul, the prophet Moses would say, son, daughter, God, he just did. Let's pray. Father, thank you for such a clear word. Because of this book, we don't have to guess what's in your heart. Instead, we can know how seriously you take our sin and yet how much you desired our salvation. Thank you for words of comfort, for words of clarity, words that give us direction, and more than anything, words that give us peace. Without this book, we'd always have to wonder if people like us could see your face. But you gave us this book that centers on Jesus so that we know through his forgiveness, we always can. And in fact, right now through faith, we know that we will. Thank you for this comfort. We pray that you would help us to grow in our faith today as we read this book. And we ask this all boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. The other day, a 12-year-old asked me a really difficult question. We have these little cards that we leave in our programs during the church services where people can ask honest questions about our church or about God or about the Bible. And this 12-year-old left me a really simple short question. It just said, why Christianity? I thought that was a pretty good and and bold question to ask as a 12-year-old. He was asking me as a Christian pastor, why Christianity? Yeah, I opened this book. I say this is the word of God, but why trust this book instead of the other holy books of other religions? Why Christianity? And I'm hoping to run into him at church one of these days because I've been thinking about an answer that I'd give. Why would we read this book? Why would we believe it actually comes from God? Why would we choose this path instead of another? And let me give you a little hint of what my answer is going to be to him. Three things. The prophets, the apostles, and Jesus. Why should you be compelled to read this book? Not just because of the hundred million copies it sells every year, but because of its unique place in anything that's ever been written. The prophets, the apostles, and Jesus. Here's what I mean. The prophets are some of the people that fill the pages of the Old Testament. Remember, that's what happened B.C., before Christ. And yet, what the prophets say is often so specific And it's so accurate to what happened in the life of Jesus that it seems like there's no way they could ever have known that unless God was speaking through them. 
I think of the story we heard earlier this week of that Ethiopian man who's reading the scroll of Isaiah. And he was just on that page in Isaiah chapter 53 where it said that the Messiah would come and he would be pierced for our transgressions. He wouldn't open his mouth and object to his injustice and said he would die, be buried in a rich man's tomb, and then see the light of life. And you have to ask yourself, how in the world did Isaiah know that? How did he know that Jesus would be pierced? How did he know that Jesus wouldn't talk back during his trial? How did he know that Jesus wouldn't be buried in any tomb but in the tomb of a rich man? His name was Joseph of Arimathea. And how in the world did he know that the Messiah would come back to life and see light at the resurrection from the grave? Well, the easiest answer to that question is because Isaiah wasn't speaking on his own. He had help because all scripture is God-breathed. The prophets. But then there's the apostles. 2,000 years ago, if you would have run into the apostle Peter or the apostle John on the street and asked them that question, why Christianity? They wouldn't have said, well, because that's how I was raised. Or, that's what I've always believed. Or, I don't know, I just really feel like it's true in my heart. (laughs) Now, do you know what Peter and John would have said? Do you know what they actually said in the book of Acts? We witnessed it. And you did too. When they would try to persuade people who weren't convinced about Jesus, they would not just appeal to personal beliefs or emotional feelings. They would appeal to historical facts. That people of that time knew that Jesus of Nazareth was put on a cross and not just one or two close followers, but dozens, even hundreds of people had witnessed him alive after his death. Why Christianity? It's the predictions of the prophets. It's the eyewitness of the apostles. And my third answer is this. Jesus. In this book, when we read about Jesus, we find something that no one else offers us. We find a God of crazy, relentless, unconditional love. Yeah, this morning, uh, after I made breakfast for my wife and daughters, I opened my Bible to do a little bit of personal study and this was the verse that I read. Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us according to the will of God our Father. And those words stunned me. But Jesus didn't give a little money or a little time. He gave himself. He actually died. Why? For our sins. I sinned and you sinned. I was impatient and you were proud. I didn't put my family first. You didn't respect your boss. We've sinned in so many ways. So what did Jesus do? He gave himself. (laughs) And get this, it's according to the will of our God and Father. This is what God willed. It's what he wanted. It's what made God pleased and happy to give his one and only son so that people like us, sinners like us, could be rescued and one day see the face of God. Who would make that up? What man-made religion would say, it's just a gift. It's all grace. It's yours through faith in Jesus. So, I can't wait to see this 12-year-old. <laughs> Why Christianity? I'm going to tell him the crazy predictions of, of the prophets, the incredible eyewitness accounts of the apostles, and the incredible and gracious uniqueness of Jesus. I hope it convinces him and I hope it convinces you to read this book, not just today, but for the rest of your life. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, who who would do what you did? Sometimes at the end of a day, I'm frustrated with myself and I can't believe I fell into the same struggle and sin again, but you gave up everything and you knew that I would struggle. You knew that we would sin so frequently in so many ways. You knew that we would repeat the same old things again and again and yet you gave up everything. And Heavenly Father, that was your will. You were a God of such patience and love. It's, it's almost impossible for us to grasp. I thank you that you put down the words of love in this book, the Bible. And now I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help me, that you would help us to open the pages of this book, to treasure it, to meditate on it, and to seek you through it. Our days are filled with a thousand good things that we could do, but never, never, never let those good things take the place of the best thing to hear your voice, to have you comfort our hearts, and in some way through faith to see your glorious and accepting face. We pray this, God, and we thank you for your word. We ask it all today in Jesus' name. Amen.